But through the hallways of academia And on the face of the moon The footprints of conquest Haven't left us any room To say Greetings, and welcome to the 55th edition podcast of Women's Liberation Radio News for this Thursday, November 5th, 2020. I'm Jenna DeQuarto, WLRN team member, ever the grateful lesbian, and recovering Roman Catholic. This month's edition focuses on a feminist analysis of Christianity. Listener Chris Wind sent us several of her recordings from the 1980s of feminist sound collages that inspired us to create this podcast. Later on, we'll play you the full recording of her piece, I Am Eve, to begin our discussion of this topic. We'll also hear an in-house interview Thistle did with WLRN's Danny Whitaker about her Christian upbringing and where she feels the Venn diagram of patriarchal religion and transgender ideology overlap. Finally, Sekhmet Shiawal brings us to the end of the program with her commentary on the subject and why so many women find Christianity appealing and compelling. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics, except for separatist feminism, is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. To start off today's edition, here's Emily Ann Lorenzen with women's news from around the globe for this Thursday. November 5th, 2020. In Kenya, about 2,800 girls have undergone female genital mutilation, or FGM, during a month-long, quote, cutting season, unquote. FGM is illegal in Kenya, but the practice has gone underground, and amid the COVID-19 lockdowns, families can engage in cutting without worrying about being caught. Celebrations have erupted in communities after girls have undergone FGM. Natalie Roby Tingo, the founder of Mashana Empowerment Korea, an organization working to end FGM, said, quote, To begin with, families were concealing the practice, but by the second and third week, girls were being paraded openly on the streets as there had been no repercussions. Unquote. She adds that she has never seen FGM at the scale of visibility. Families struggling financially are cutting their daughters to increase their, quote, bride price, unquote. And the practice itself is lucrative for those doing the cutting. The UK are working with Kenya to fight FGM, and the county commissioner of Kurion, Kenya, quote, indicted 10 administrative chiefs for failures to report cutting events and collusion to perform FGM in their area. In Bangladesh, women have suffered a silent rape crisis, but amid a surge of sexual assault and rape cases over the past few months, women broke their silence by taking to the streets in protest. According to the ASK, a local human rights organization, 975 rape cases were recorded between January and September, including 208 gang rapes. Between April and August, about 230 rape cases were recorded. A Human Rights Watch spokesperson said that this data probably only reflects a fraction of the actual number of cases since most women do not report rape. On October 13th, the Bangladeshi parliament approved an amendment to the Prevention of Women and Children Repression Act of 2000 that added a death penalty for rape. Amnesty International's South Asia researcher, Sultan Mohammed Zakaria, said, quote, unless the Bangladeshi authorities fix the flawed criminal justice system, 
address loopholes in laws and procedures, and improve the rule of law situation, merely imposing harsher punishment will unlikely have any impact on the ground. There is little to no support services available to the victims of violence against women. Even the legal support is scanty." Unquote. Many perpetrators are also protected by those in power. With low reporting and conviction rates, women's rights activists in Bangladesh want the government to take meaningful action to combat sexual violence and to support its survivors. In Poland, the Constitutional Tribunal ruled that abortions in cases of fetal defects are unconstitutional. Poland's abortion laws are some of the strictest in Europe, but this ruling is basically a total ban because 98% of the terminations in Poland are due to cases of severe fetal disabilities. Terminations are now only legal in cases of rape, incest, or if the mother's health is at risk. About a thousand legal abortions took place last year, and women's rights groups estimate between 80,000 and 120,000 Polish women a year seek an abortion abroad. In 2016, about 100,000 people protested against an attempt to tighten abortion laws, and there is speculation that the Constitutional Tribunal took advantage of the pandemic lockdown since large groups were not able to protest. However, small groups of people did protest in Warsaw and Poznan, standing two meters apart and holding signs. In the United States, volunteers from the Women's Human Rights Campaign protested the ban on abortions at the Polish Embassy. Since the ruling on October 22nd, large protests have erupted in Warsaw, defying the COVID-19 restrictions banning gatherings of more than five people. On October 31st, there was a huge demonstration with about 100,000 people. Amid these protests, the Polish government has delayed implementing the new abortion restrictions. In the UK, the sex trafficking of Romanian women has reached an industrial scale. According to journalist Kirstein Patterson, quote, Sex trafficking is the most common form of human trafficking in the European Union, with 95% of the victims being female. Trafficking for sexual exploitation is also believed to be the most profitable form of modern slavery, with each victim generating almost 10 times the profits for their exploiter than the average level." Unquote. Romanian authorities said that the trafficked women were living in poverty and that traffickers had tricked them with promises of a better life. UK Feminista organized an online summit on October 26th with politicians, senior police officers, and diplomats to discuss the problem and to find solutions. Detective Sergeant Stuart Pial led a nine-month investigation into a gang that trafficked Romanian women for sex across Northwest England, and he said, quote, until we bust the business model of sex trafficking by cracking down on demand and pimping websites, the sex trafficking will continue. Right now, sex trafficking is too profitable and too easy in this country." Unquote. His sentiments seem to sum up the consensus of those who attended the summit. In the southeastern Asian country, Myanmar, Women who worked in garment factories have been forced into prostitution after the factories closed due to COVID-19. Hundreds of garment factories closed after Western fashion brands canceled their orders, causing thousands of women to lose their jobs. The founder of the campaign group Sex Workers in Myanmar said that more women have entered prostitution during the pandemic despite there being less clients because, quote, they have no option. Unquote. Prostitution is illegal in Myanmar, and women face up to three years in prison if they are caught. Ki, who has been prostituting for 14 years, said, quote, A lot of factory girls are naive and have no experience in this work, so they get easily arrested when they can't differentiate between customers and police informants. Unquote. She explained that she and other prostitutes have to sleep with the police or bribe low-ranking officers in order to avoid arrest. 
Officers then warn them when informants are in the area. She said that, quote, it's part of the game in this industry, unquote. Many women, including Key, keep their actions a secret due to stigma. In Zimbabwe, women's rights activists are being jailed, raped, and tortured. The women are kept in inhumane conditions at Chikorobi, Zimbabwe's most notorious prison. Sitabayo Diwa is the executive director of the Women's Academy for Leadership and Political Excellence, and she spent several weeks there after being arrested in May last year for, quote, attempting to overthrow the government of President Emerson Minangagwa, unquote. She said, quote, the past two years alone have been dramatic and very difficult for women human rights defenders and activists. We have witnessed the arbitrary arrests, torture, assault, abduction, sexual abuse, and harassment of women leaders by suspected state security agents. The COVID-19 pandemic has also not made life easier for women as the government has taken advantage of the restrictions to clamp down on women who dare challenge the abuses and state excesses." Unquote. The targeting of women activists and leaders takes place against the backdrop of crackdowns on all forms of opposition to the government. In New Hampshire, Franklin Pierce University rescinded its, quote, transgender participation and inclusion policy, unquote, for school sports after reaching an agreement to resolve a case the U.S. Department of Education filed against the university. The case stemmed from a civil rights complaint by the Concerned Women of America, or the CWA, against the university after C.C. Telfer, a trans-identified male, won a national women's title at the 2019 Division II NCAA Track and Field Championships. The DOE's Office for Civil Rights found that the university's policy violates Title IX. Penny Nance is the CWA's Chief Executive Officer and President and she said, quote, Federal action against Franklin Pierce University is a warning shot to the NCAA and every college and university in America to back off policies that discriminate against female student athletes and to restore fairness and equity in women's sports, unquote. In the UK, World Rugby has decided that trans-identified males who have been through puberty will not be permitted to compete with women due to safety concerns. They claim that according to new research, men taking estrogen does not decrease their advantage over women. World Rugby said in a statement, quote, the new guidelines do not recommend that trans women play women's contact rugby on safety grounds at the elite and international level of the game where size, strength, power, and speed are crucial for both risk and performance, but do not preclude national unions from flexibility in their application of the guidelines at the community level of the game." Trans-identified males would still be allowed to play non-contact rugby with women, and the guidelines do not apply to males who have not been through puberty. Trans-identified females are still permitted to play in men's contact rugby. That concludes WLRN's World News segment for Thursday, November 5th, 2020. I'm Emily Ann Lorenzen. Share your news stories and tips with us by emailing wlrnewscontact at gmail.com and let us know what's going on. sin, have been guilty even before they acted. 
doomed before they started. I alone have been held responsible for this sad, pathetic, fallen race. Therefore, let me begin by correcting this. If I were free not to fall in the first place, they were free not to fall after me. And if I were not free, then I can't be held responsible for my fall or theirs. Now, let us further examine the charges. Let us correctly define that action. I have been condemned for choosing knowledge over ignorance. of the knowledge of good and evil. In a society that praises pursuit of knowledge and honors men of wisdom, why have I been viewed with disfavor? Had Adam reached out first, would he have been so rebuked? Or is the state of ignorance requisite for women only? Histories pass on, Socrates. They pass over Aspasia. In the same vein, I chose experience over innocence. In a context of attitudes that value experience, the disapproval of my action can only imply the desire that women, like children, live in a state of innocence. I have also been condemned for disobedience. Then why wasn't the tree so named, the tree of obedience and disobedience, or the tree of temptation? By naming it what it was not, God either deliberately tempted me or deliberately deceived me. And he should be judged, not I. Perhaps, though, the tree really was a tree of knowledge of good and evil. In that case, one should wonder what insecurities led God to prefer obedience over knowledge. Indeed, one should wonder why he went so far as to forbid knowledge. The reason is evident in Genesis. He didn't want us to equal him. He sent us out of Eden to prevent our eating from the tree of life, because already we were as wise as he, for having eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and if we had made it to the tree of life before he found us, we would have been immortal as well. We would have been as godly as he. We would have been as godly as godly as he. We would have been as godly as godly as he. We would have been as godly as he. We would have been as godly as he. We would have been as godly as he. And that takes us onward. For counted among my sins is that of pride. Considering that later, through his Son, God commands us to follow in his footsteps, I find the label of pride odd for the action that would do just that, make me like God. Furthermore, I find it odd to be condemned for being like God, when after all, he created us in his image. And God certainly is proud. To create us in his image can be called narcissistic, and to prefer us to spend our time admiring him rather than learning about him is equally evidential of pride. 
as an aside, I would think that my knowledge would increase my admiration. That was not why I ate the fruit, but if it was, would it have mattered? Did God ever ask my intent? 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 Ask my intent? Ever ask my intent? Ever ask my intent? Ever ask my intent? I have also been charged with a lack of faith. Yet I took it on faith in the first place that God told us not to eat from the tree. Remember, He gave the command to Adam before I even existed. Further, I had faith in the serpent. I trusted the serpent to be telling the truth. Is it dishonorable to trust? Dishonorable to trust. Dishonorable to trust. Dishonorable to trust. To trust. Dishonorable to trust. To trust. Dishonorable to trust. Dishonorable to trust. 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 Dishonorable to trust. And is it reprehensible to act on that trust, as I did then in offering the fruit to another, to Adam? God commanded innocence, then held me responsible for an act of innocent intent. For how could I know my faith was misplaced? How could I know the serpent was evil until I ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? By telling us not to eat of the tree, he insisted on ignorance, but then held us responsible for an act of ignorance. Lastly, I have been condemned for using my reason. 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 My reason. For it is through the exercise of reason that I decided to eat the fruit. The serpent's explanation of God's motives seemed very reasonable to me. God's command, on the other hand, not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil because then I'd die, seemed a touch unreasonable. Where is the fault in using that faculty given to me by God? The fault is not mine, but God's. He made reason guide our will and left our reason prey to deceit. Or did he? History has it that the serpent's words were false, that I was deceived. But God's explanation is identical to the serpent's. Compare Genesis 3, verse 5 with 21. The serpent was telling the telling truth. The truth. Telling, telling the truth. Telling, telling, telling the truth. Telling the truth. And so I stand condemned too for listening to truth. To truth. To truth. To truth. To truth. And for offering truth to others. Offering truth to others. To others. Offering. Offering truth to others. To others. Offering truth. Offering truth to others. To others. Offering truth to others. Offering truth to others. That was Chris Wind, WLRN listener who reached out to us with her sound collage called I Am Eve that she recorded in 1987 when the U.S. feminist movement was at a particularly strong point. Next up, we'll hear Daniel Whitaker's response and reflections on Wind's sound collage poem you just heard. When you grow up enveloped in religion, with Christianity as your only available path of thinking, it can take decades to change your relationship with the ideology you've been fed from birth. In fact, many people never awaken from it at all, retaining the beliefs they were taught as children throughout their entire lives. Such is the power of religious indoctrination. As a child, like so many in the Western world, I was presented the biblical story of creation as truth in which Adam and Eve, Eve especially, of course, were naughty, ungrateful children who refused the gift of paradise offered to them by a loving, if stern, Father-in-Heaven deity. 
Eternal damnation resulting from a single act of disobedience was enough to frighten any child into compliance. My image of Eve was a weak, rebellious, and impulsive woman who should have listened to her male partner and male God. Now I realize that is exactly how I was supposed to see her. Of course, a woman's quest for knowledge would be the original sin of all humanity. Of course, a woman would be blamed for a man's actions. She tempted Adam, after all. He was simply an unlucky victim of her manipulative feminine wiles. It was years before I was able to see this classic tale from such an opposing perspective, and not even until listening to Chris Wynn's piece had I realized the depth of the flaws within biblical ideology. It seems impossible now how anyone could overlook the crystal clear misogyny of a woman being punished by a dominant male figure for seeking to overcome her own ignorance. Then again, it took me nearly three decades of my life to see it that way. What makes Wynne's piece so effective is her use of logic over emotion. Her simple yet powerful arguments make deconstructing the weak biblical reasoning look effortless. One cannot help but notice the timelessness of Eve's plight, considering how many women over the ages have been punished for seeking knowledge, forbidden from accessing education, and condemned for using logic against fallible male arguments. Women who defy the expectation that they remain ignorant, innocent, and obedient to male demands have faced persecution since the Bible was written, and even before. In a sense, every woman's fate has been modeled after Eve's. What has been fed to us as the original sin was really the original defiance of patriarchy, a sin for which women are still being punished today. In a short, straightforward effort, Wind exposes the fact that the very core of Christianity, from its initial defining narrative, is unequivocally one of the strongest bricks in the foundation of patriarchy. It reinforces it, holds it up, keeps it standing strong even today, with all the advances we've made, with all the evidence we have, all the facts and reason right before our eyes, patriarchal religion still dominates the world, keeping misogyny alive and well. It is my hope that more and more women begin listening to their sisters who have escaped the confines of religious indoctrination, that more women like wind will speak up, and more women, still entrapped, will hear. The Great Fall Beneath the peach tree, Lilith cradles Eve in her serpent tail, lulling her with pleasure hymns. Lilith's smooth scales soothe Eve's memory of her original lover, the serpent phallus squashed by Adam's boredom with beasts. Lilith massages Eve's devil's teat Eve moans and bites Lilith's peach, juice dripping down her breast through shallow breaths. Lilith makes Eve reach death, revealing that she does not need the tree of knowledge. Lilith and Eve leave Eden, while Adam weeps into wool. That was my original poem, The Great Fall. Next up, hear an interview Thistle did with WLRN's Danny Whitaker about being brought up Christian and how feminist analysis continues to liberate her from her strict Christian upbringing. All right, so I've got Donnie Whitaker on the line. How are you today, Donnie? I'm doing well. How about you, Thistle? I'm doing well. I'm excited to talk with you about Christianity and your experience of Christianity when you were growing up and your discovery of feminism and how it helped you make a decision to not stay in the church and not continue with your Christianity. Yeah, yeah, there was there were many years, many years of crazy. <laughs> Talk about it. What what was crazy about growing up Christian? 
Well, I, honestly, I, I think what's most disturbing is that at, at the time growing up throughout my whole childhood, it, it wasn't crazy. It was all I knew. Um, and I, I know my experience is maybe more typical for the more you know, people who grew up in more fundamentalist environments, maybe not so much the liberal Christians, you know, that you've seen more of in the past few decades. Um, but our church was very, wouldn't quite classify it as a cult, but it was very much sort of borderline cultish in its behavior. I mean, it was, you know, the women weren't allowed to, you know, cut their hair for a while or wear makeup or things like that. Um, so it was very, very controlling in that way. Um, and it was, it was very elitist. So the idea was, and of course, this is pretty common in any religious ideology is that, you know, you think you have the, you're the only ones with the real truth and all the other religions and, you know, atheists and pagans and everyone else is just misguided, you know, by Satan <laughs> to, you know, blinded from the, from the real truth. So when, when you grow up with that and, um, you know, all of my friends were pretty much in the church. So there was really no exposure to any other idea. And this is, you know, before the internet. And, you know, I didn't, wasn't out able to watch a lot of TV and had very few friends outside the church. And all of that was very, all those interactions were very controlled. So I think when, when you grow up with just a singular perspective, without even the idea that there could be any other valid alternative ways of looking at anything that's that's kind of hard to get out of um yeah it just yeah it takes it takes a lot of practice and a lot of self-education so what got you out of it um it was it was honestly very gradual um you know when I became a teenager I was sort of typical in the sense of wanting to sort of distance myself from my parents and their old fashioned ideas. I mean, I stopped going to church when I was 14, um, which, you know, there had been a lot of changes in our church. So our, our parents were a little disillusioned with the church at that point anyway. So they didn't, they didn't give me too much of a hard time about no longer going to church, um, you know, cause they were kind of looking at different church options at that point too. So I kind of, you know, that was kind of the first step. Um, and then in my late teens, when I realized, you know, I was same sex attracted, that kind of was, was the second step. Um, but even at that point, you know, I was still, I kind of reconciled that, you know, with my beliefs by, you know, this more contemporary idea of like, you know, Jesus is this loving, accepting father figure. So, you know, it's okay to be gay because, you know, Jesus is part of the New Testament and, things are more accepted, you know, where you kind of just do that Christian thing where you just forget that the Old Testament exists. <laughs> hmm. So, um, yeah, but it wasn't, it wasn't actually until um, college where I took a, a world literature class and we were studying mythology, which in my mind at the time was, you know, you think of Greek mythology or you think of, you know, old fashioned religions from other cultures. And it wasn't until starting to study that, that I began to see that Christianity was really just another myth. I mean, from every other perspective, everyone in the non-Western world, we were, they saw us, you know, Christianity as a myth, the way that we might look at old Greek myths and Roman myths. So that was kind of the big step into stepping, stepping outside of Christianity and seeing that there was really no basis in reality for what I'd been taught. And I think that was mm -hmm. kind of the, the the big leap that kind of led me out. And what role did feminism play, especially considering that Christianity, like a lot of other world religions, is a male-dominated religion? Um, did did feminism play a role in you deciding to leave the church too? I think in the in the background at the time that that was part of it. Um, I mean, obviously, on kind of a, a surface level, I recognized that Christianity was not a, you know, feminist friendly ideology or religion. But honestly, I, I feel like um, getting out of, of religion was more my stepping stone in, into feminist fem feminism, um, because once I started reading more about religion and reading critique of religion. And um, it made me more aware of what was going on in, in liberal feminism and sort of liberal ideology in general, which was this sort of broad 
acceptance of different religious practices, like especially in Islam with, you know, we had all these women out there, you know, young women calling themselves feminist and then claiming that, you know, wearing hijab is an empowering choice. And it was kind of, that's what kind of actually led me into radical feminism is this path through religion and realizing that actually the people who, you know, are claiming to be what I'm supposed to be, which is, you know, left wing liberal, they're actually saying these things that, that don't make any sense to me from a feminist standpoint. And that was kind of <laughs> what led me in that direction. Mm hmm. What kind of feminist analysis do you have of Christianity? I mean, to me, it's, I mean, I don't want to say that it is, it is the, you know, fundamental root of patriarchy because I think patriarchal structures existed before Christianity, but I think it is the, the most vibrant root at this point that is keeping and that has kept patriarchy alive for so long. I mean, because it's so widespread um, and not just Christianity, but all the other patriarchal monotheistic religions throughout the world, um, Christianity is kind of just, you know, the more Western ex example or manifestation of that. But I think because it's been so, it's gained so much power over the years and the millennia that it's completely dominated our culture and it defines so much of our culture and just sort of infests sort of every crack and crevice. And I think so much of patriarchy that we see today just has its roots in Christianity. Um, I think kind of every, almost everything can be tied back to it. What about the radical nuns that are pro-choice? You know, you've heard of women in Christian organizations in the Christian church, Catholic women, you know, Catholic workers, um, people who call themselves Christian but are feminists or women who are feminists within the Christian church. Do you think that's possible? I'm Honestly, no. I think it's possible to hold conflicting beliefs, like two or more conflicting beliefs at once. And it kind of, that kind of reminds me of, you know, um, gay people who consider themselves Christians or honestly, I, I've actually, as horrible as this is, I've now seen some women online calling themselves radical feminists, but who are anti-abortion or who are Christian. And obviously they're appropriating the term radical feminist, they don't really understand what it is. But I mean, no, I, I don't think it's, I, don't, I think true feminism, as you and I would see it, has to go to the root of patriarchy and Christianity is one of those roots. So, I mean, you can believe in, I mean, I don't, I don't remember whether the Bible specifically says anything explicit about abortion. So, I mean, maybe, and of course everyone interprets it in their own way anyway. So I, of course you can have a nun who believes and in, interprets the Bible in her own way and then still believes that it's, you know, okay for women to get abortions. So, but I don't, I don't think that's feminism just in itself. I mean, I think there's lots of women out there who are pro-choice, but that I wouldn't consider feminist beyond that one stance, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. So for you, you had to be, you, you had to leave the church in order to really explore your feminism. Yeah, I think I had to sort of shed that skin entirely before, before I could because I mean, and most women will never really get into feminism to the to the depth that you know that we have. Um, you know, most women I know who call themselves feminists are you know very much what we would consider liberal feminists, and it's all very much about personal individual empowerment rather than collective liberation. So I think I think you definitely abandoning religion if that was something you you were you know, that was part of you growing up, I think that's kind of a, a prerequisite for coming into feminism or, you know, for some people it happens simultaneously or something like that. But I abandoning I religion can... altogether. Well, at least the, the type of religion we're talking about. Patriarchal religions, because right, there are right. lots of feminists who practice goddess worship and, you know, um, Dianic paganism, which is a mm. women only 
practice of paganism that's feminist. Right, right. No, I'm specifically thinking like along the lines of Christianity, Judaism, Islam. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, all the patriarchal ones. Yeah. So, uh, as you know, <laughs> there's a big struggle right now in society between those who believe in gender and gender ideology and those who are working towards women's sex-based rights and making sure that the distinction between sex and gender uh, is intact. What do you think Christianity or patriarchal religion has in common with how we're seeing transgenderism manifest in our society? Well, first and foremost, the trans activism is dominated by men. I mean, it's, you know, we don't, when you look at the trans activist movement, I I can't even think of a single trans identified female, you know, who would consider themselves a trans man. Uh, I can't even think of one off the top of my head who is dominant in the movement in their, what they call activism. I mean, that's the first, that's definitely the first comparison I would make is it's, it's still patriarchal. Like it's just another form of patriarchy under a, a different name, under a different lens, a different label. It's got new wrapping, but I think that's, that's the first clue. And the fact that the ideas they're presenting, they're presenting them with such passionate, um, I guess this sort of this dogmatic idea, because that's the only way that they can, I think, get anyone to subscribe to it is by being so dogmatic about it, which Honestly, I think is the only way that um, religions like Christianity have flourished is because the ideas are not their faith. They're faith based. They're not based in reality. They're not based in science. They're not based in common sense. It's all this personal fantasy. And to get people to to buy into that, you have to be very dogmatic about it and very aggressive. And that's exactly what we're seeing from them. Mm hmm. And then looking back at my own background uh, in Christianity, it's like there's a conversion experience that happens. You know how um, when I was growing up, uh, there was a fundamentalist Christian group at my high school. They would come into the high school and try to recruit us to go to this program after school called Campus Life. And they were trying to convert us to Christianity. And the way you would be converted would be by accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and going through a ritual and like renouncing um, things and behaviors that you had done before. And now you were best friends with God and Jesus and moving forward on this new path and you were converted. And Mm -hmm. I feel like with transgenderism, it's similar. It's like you get converted to being trans, you know? Yeah, and it's very much, and the fact that they, you know, these grown adult men primarily are going after young children, trying to convince them that their, you know, insecurities over their own bodies, their disillusionment with, you know, gender roles, they're they're exploiting that and using that to lure them into this, I mean, essentially, I would consider it a cult, based, especially based on the way that they treat people when they're in inside, um, which is that you, you know, you have to think a certain way, you have to use certain language, you have to distance yourself from everyone who doesn't agree with, with the group think, which is very much very similar to the fundamentalist Christian, you know, sects that like, like the one I grew up in. Um, and especially the way that they treat people who leave, you know, detransitioners, um, it's very similar to, to what I witnessed when someone would, would leave our church. You know, we talked about them as if they had just, you know, they were just this sort of stain on the church. And we never spoke to them again. We never associated with them again. And we just consider them to be, you know, oh, they were misguided. They were led astray. And it seems very much like that's how they treat detra- detransitioners. Um, they want nothing to do with them. They try to silence them from speaking out, which is you see that a lot in like um, like Scientology. I mean, that's 
that's some really scary stuff when someone tries to leave Scientology. I mean, I've heard some some really crazy stories, you know, up to the point of, you know, them going after people and murdering them. So Hmm. it's yeah. All right. So we're talking about two different patriarchal cults, basically. There's transgenderism and there's Christianity Mm -hmm. and they sort of work hand in hand in a way to control people, uh, to control people's thoughts, their minds, their bodies and their behaviors. And um, in the end, it's just it's it's the antithesis to liberation, which is what feminism is about, is about it's about the liberation of women from male rule. And so, of course, if we have a feminist analysis of Christianity, this patriarchal religion, we're also going to have a feminist analysis of transgenderism and both lead people along this path that um, kind of ends in death and destruction. You know what I mean? Like there's that necrophilic Mm -hmm. aspect to Christianity, Mm -hmm. uh, the the worship of death and torture um, with Jesus hanging on the cross the way that he does and that being held up as something good. Same Mm -hmm. thing with like the surgeries, you know, the genital surgeries and how that's a kind of a form of torture, but it's being held up as, as this thing that's good. And, you know, why can't people see this, Danielle? Why don't they see the parallels? Like these good liberals that are atheists and against, let's say they just, they're against religion in general um, and against Christianity and the conservative aspects of Christianity, you know, the anti-abortion aspects of Christianity but yet they embrace transgenderism, you know, why can't they see the parallels? It's, you know, I I feel like it's, it's, it's because, you know, gender is, is something that's very complex because it isn't talked about. It's, you know, we talk about, we use different language to talk about specific things that are part of the gender hierarchy, but we don't name it. We don't, talk about it as the gender hierarchy. We talk about gender equality and just even just the word equality in general, which is supposed to mean, you know, what does it even mean? Um, You know, so we can look and say, oh, well, women are paid less than men. So we have the wage gap and we'll address that and then make sure, you know, abortion is legal and then that's fine. And then they think that that's pretty much the extent of women's rights at this point. And I think because gender is so ingrained from, you know, especially from religions like Christianity. I think it's, it's hard for people to think about because it's not not talked about at, at, at the root level. And it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, the idea of liberation because both Christianity and transgenderism try to sell their ideology as this path to liberation, you know, with Christianity, it's, you know, they, they both glorify suffering too, as this, this way to achieve essentially different forms of enlightenment. Um, And, you know, so that's, it's, it's especially disturbing to see it, to see it happening to kids because both religions go after, you know, both Christianity and uh, similar religions as well as transgenderism. They go after kids because they know kids are easy to manipulate and to indoctrinate. Yeah. And, you know, the trans idea of, you know, liberation is you have to do all this stuff and think a certain way and do this to your body and you know and 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 then you can be your authentic self and it's kind of like we're sold that idea with christianity too where you know you follow this path and you then you have true freedom through jesus and it's just it's really a pretty blatant lie because it's all just a trap yeah yeah so you know patriarchy is the religion that reigns supreme in the world and manifests itself through all of these other, all of these ideologies like Christianity, Mm -hmm. like Islam, like transgenderism, but really it's like patriarchy itself is the problem and is the, the rule of, of the land of, of the whole world. Yeah. So it's wonderful to be able to band together with women like you Danielle and to talk about it 
to unpack it, to analyze it, and to contribute to a grassroots movement. So thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with me today. Yes, thank you. From across the femisphere to women worldwide, worldwide, to women worldwide, radical feminist media to break the sound barrier, break the sound barrier, break the sound barrier, break the sound barrier, radical feminist media to break the sound barrier. This is your, 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 your grassroots community radio station, your radio station, grassroots. This is your grassroots community radio station, women's liberation radio Radio News. news. Christianity has been shaping the lives of women and girls for over 2,000 years now. More than 2 billion people on Earth are Christians today, making up almost one-third of the human population, and they can be found on every continent, in every race and ethnicity. More than a religious or spiritual belief system, Christianity has long been a cultural influence, affecting everything from politics to entertainment to medicine and more. Christian iconography and biblical references pop up in our movies, TV shows, books, and music all the time, not because the artistic pieces themselves are Christian, but because Christian mythology is woven throughout our collective consciousness now as the original story. When it comes to women, Christianity has long influenced how women see themselves, how they're treated in society, how they behave, and how sexual politics are framed and managed. Everything from the virgin and whore dichotomy to the idea of holy motherhood to the model of heterosexual marriage featuring a dominant husband and a submissive wife can trace their roots back to Christian theology and the Bible. The political and social impact of Christianity on women and girls in particular cannot be underestimated. In the United States, Christianity explains much of the right-wing female population. Women who vote Republican despite being poverty, working, or middle class are almost always religious to some degree, and usually Christian. They often come from Christian families and marry Christian men. Their Christianity directly informs their politics. Christianity has also intertwined itself with the racism and white supremacy of these white Republicans, despite people of all races believing in the same religion. Christianity, and more specifically, the will of God, has become the explanation and defense for the most conservative right-wing politics. While the men of this political persuasion are undoubtedly the ones steering the ship of their party and movements, the women who marry them and raise them and who are raised by them go willingly and enthusiastically along with the male's agenda because their Christian values compel them to do so. Most of them are utterly incapable of explaining why fiscal conservatism, capitalism, white supremacy, and U.S. militaristic imperialism are Christian in nature and the will of their God, but that's what the Christian right-wing men preach, so that's what their women believe. Christianity has millions of women worldwide passionately opposed to their own reproductive control leading anti-abortion movements, condemning contraceptives, decrying voluntary sterilization. Liberal pro-choice women love to target right-wing religious men in the abortion argument using taglines like my body, my choice, and no uterus, no opinion. But the truth is, many of the most aggressively anti-abortion activists are religious women. It is women who have showed up to protest in front of abortion clinics and Planned Parenthood locations across America. It is women who show up to the annual March for Life in the United States with their signs that say pro-life is pro-woman and stop abortion now. Men may have authored the original anti-abortion literature and may be the ones preaching against abortion from the pulpit, but it's Christian women who have been doing the heavy lifting, the grunt work of the anti-abortion movement all along. No other issue better represents how Christian men use Christian women to reinforce religion-fueled patriarchy. There are Christian women all over America who vote Republican for the sole reason that Democrats are pro-choice, and these women want Roe v. Wade repealed. This kind of woman is exactly why feminism cannot and will not succeed. It isn't the men standing in the way of global female liberation from male oppression. 
it's women. Right-wing religious women are not the only handmaidens of patriarchy, but they are the most obvious, and at least in the United States, some of the most powerful. The Christian, politically conservative woman who serves as a pillar for her man's power in society is the perfect example of how patriarchy turns women against ourselves simply through brainwashing. The Christian right woman is not a helpless victim being coerced by the men in her community. She may be their pawn, but she has agency. She reinforces male power in the church and in secular society because she genuinely believes it's the right thing to do. It's not enough to criticize patriarchal religion and the women who buy into it. We have to analyze why so many women around the world are genuinely invested in these religions as the truth, despite the religion's shameless misogyny and sexism and all of the abuse women and girls experience at the hands of men in their churches. Christianity is like any other male-invented, male-centric, male supremacist religion. It offers women the illusion of control, justice, meaning, and hope. This is a highly seductive cocktail, even without the added benefits of community and familial approval that religious belief and participation offer. Christianity allows women to believe they can control, to some extent, the course of their lives through following Christianity's rules. Religion operates on the same basic system of reward and punishment that patriarchy itself uses. If you think and behave the way the male god wants, he will be good to you. If you disobey and reject him, he will punish you. Ultimately, this system of punishment and reward is carried out by the men of the church in the only ways women can actually measure it. Whatever Christian women consider God's rewards and punishment are purely speculative. A Christian woman can tell herself that if she successfully lives a moral life according to her religion's doctrine, she can affect her experience in a positive way. Whereas if she lives immorally according to Christianity, God will punish her sooner or later. In order to avoid God's punishment, which the Christian woman can see as any negative thing that happens to her, all she has to do is follow the rules laid out in the Bible and at her church. This view of life appeals to certain personality types that crave submission to authority. Rules make order out of chaos. Without rules, there is only freedom, and that scares women who want a male leader to follow who can tell them the right way and the wrong way to be. Most women have a genuine desire to be good people, and for the Christian woman, the concept of goodness is inextricably linked with Christian morality. She cannot be a good person if she is not obedient to Christian rules, nor can anybody else, for that matter. Because she follows the rules of her Christian God, she is not only a good moral person, but someone far superior in character to all the non-Christians of the world. In this sense, Christian living provides the woman with the opportunity to feel better than other people. It creates a social hierarchy in her mind and places her at the top of it. It feeds her ego. Christianity gives women a way to explain their own suffering and the suffering of others to themselves using religious logic. Christian women often spout religious truisms like, everything happens for a reason, and God has a plan, or God works in mysterious ways which on the surface sound like simple dismissals that allow women to not think too much or too hard about the bad things that happen to them. These truisms symbolize the Christian woman's belief in cosmic order and the meaning it gives to their lives and their suffering. If everything happens for a reason, then the loss or the trauma or the hardship is either going to take the woman to a positive final outcome, or it's a deserved punishment for some offense she's committed. If everything in the Christian woman's life unfolds according to some higher divine plan, then the bad things that happen to her despite her obedience and her faith and her good behavior are not unfair, but strategic on God's part. Without Christianity, the woman won't be able to find any meaning or explanation for her suffering. She would have to face the fact that life is unfair and irrational. The fact that sometimes terrible things happen to undeserving people for no good reason at all. She would have to swallow the bitter pill that not only is much of her suffering undeserved, but it serves no greater good. It's meaningless. Christianity promises women justice in a fundamentally unjust world. Evil men get away with their crimes against humanity, against women and girls in particular, all the time. Evil men succeed, get rich, enjoy fame and adulation, live long lives and profit off the labor and struggle of people they have power over. There is very little justice. 
that could easily make any woman jaded, angry, and depressed, thinking that the bad guys really do get away with it in the end, while she herself suffers despite her best efforts to be a good person. But if she believes in the Christian God, she can console herself with the idea that God will either punish the bad guys in life or send them to hell for eternity in death. This is obviously a satisfying belief to have, especially when you're a woman who has no power to create justice in your own life. The men who invented Christianity were savvy enough even 2,000 years ago to know that women would be attracted to the idea of divine justice and that religion could be used as a pacifier to keep victimized women calm and submissive. Vengeance is the Lord's, the Bible says, meaning women should sit at home and let their all-powerful, all-knowing God punish the men who wrong them rather than try to avenge themselves. And if those men seem to get away with their crimes and sins in life, well, God will vindicate the women by punishing the men in death. For many women and girls, the only comfort they have in a life full of cruelty and justice and suffering is the idea that their all-powerful paternal God will swoop in at the right moment and lift them out of misery, or else reward them for their obedience and loyalty with a heavenly afterlife. This idea is the one thing standing in between those women and utter despair. If there is no God, or if God is not the kind to interfere in human life, or if God does not have a system in place to determine who's rewarded and who's punished in death, then these women have no reason to hope that their suffering will ever end or improve and no reason to comfort themselves with the thought of a heavenly afterlife. They are well aware of how little control they have over their lives, how little control we all have, and their belief in a God who rewards faith and obedience of his rules helps them live with that lack of control because they think he's controlling things for their own good. Ultimately, Christianity acts as a kind of sedative for women. It keeps them calm, positive, persistent, and obedient to the men in their lives. Most importantly, Christianity does what all men's violence, force, and intimidation can't so effectively do. It makes women willing handmaidens of conservative patriarchy. It motivates women to raise their children with the same conservative, pro-male, anti-female values that they themselves hold. Christianity makes women willingly submissive to men and therefore easy to control. Christianity captures the female psyche and holds it as far away from feminist consciousness as possible. As a religious belief system, it's in complete alignment with the most fundamental patriarchal agenda. Keeping women in heterosexual marriage and motherhood, cooperative with their husbands, and focused primarily on satisfying male needs. Thanks for listening to WLRN's 55th edition podcast focused on a feminist analysis of Christianity. I'm April No. WLRN would like to thank our featured artist this month, Chris Wind, for sending us her work that inspired us to focus on the person of Eve in the Bible and the social significance of that figure in Christian myth. Thank you so much, Chris Wind, for your poem, I Am Eve, and for all the feminist performance art you created in the 1980s that still resonates with us today. If you like what you are hearing and would like to donate to the cause of Feminist Community Radio, please visit our WordPress site and click on the donate button. Check out our merch tab to get a nice gift in exchange for your donation. In addition, if you are interested in joining our team, we are always looking for new volunteers to conduct interviews, write blog posts, post to our Facebook and other social media pages, and do other tasks to keep us moving forward as a collective of media activist women. This is Emily Ann Lorenzen, signing off for now. And I'm Sekhmet Shiawal. Thanks for tuning in. Next month, we will focus our program on women and animals. Our handcrafted podcasts always come out the first Thursday of the month, so look for our next edition on Thursday, December 3rd. If you'd like to receive our newsletter that notifies you when each podcast, music show, and interview are released, please sign up on the WLRN WordPress site. Stay radical. Thanks for listening. This is Jenna DeCuardo, WLRN sound engineer and producer, signing off on another edition of WLRN's monthly handcrafted podcast.
You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Spinster, and SoundCloud, in addition to our WordPress site. Thanks for listening. We would love to hear from you, so please comment, like, and share widely. But how will we find our way out of this? What is the antidote for the patriarchal kiss? How will we find what needs to be shown? And then after that, where is home? Tell me, where is my home? Gender.